Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Josh Bokey. I am an executive director uh, for Connect for Broadband. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that is dedicated towards helping to close the digital divide. Uh, I'm very excited to be here this morning. Um, thank you uh, for being here this morning, both in person uh, as well as online. Uh, appreciate it taking the time out of your day, especially those who are, are here and online uh, to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the Literacy Council of Montgomery County uh, for inviting me here to speak this morning. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Christopher, uh, and all of this team, the staff, uh, for making this possible uh, at the C2C conference. Uh, it's been a fantastic speaker lineup here on this two-day conference. Uh, if you have been online earlier, you might have heard um, Timmy, Timothy Summers um, give a keynote address this morning, uh, and just really fantastic. Um, we are, I don't think it is... Um, um, uh, understatement to say that we are uh, living in a, in a, in a, at a pitiful, pivotal moment of time. Uh, and I know that that phrase often uh, gets used perhaps maybe too often, but I don't, like I said, don't think that's an understatement uh, in the sense that um, we are for the first time have the resources and the ability to help close the digital divide, uh, to successfully connect everyone to the digital world around us. And it's not just an opportunity to be able to do so, uh, it's imperative because it is an equity issue and really one of the, the most critical equity issues that we are facing today and being able to help ensure that everyone has the tools and technology uh, to be able to engage in the digital world in which we live, right? And that includes access to a home computer. It includes access to affordable high-speed broadband. It includes the digital literacy training and education to successfully use these technologies. A bit of a moment. Go ahead and advance the slide. There we go. Perfect. A little bit about myself and about Connect for Broadband first. Uh, I spent the last 15 years uh, in the broadband industry with a large cable communications company as their director of government affairs. Uh, and prior to that, I spent four years as a legislative staff member, actually right here uh, in the Montgomery County Council. Uh, you know, the, the, my journey kind of parallels a little bit about uh, parallels with the pandemic in the sense that when we talk about the digital divide, the digital divide is not a new issue. It has been here with us for, for many, many years. In fact, you could go back to a time when the digital divide, the technology divide, right, was between those who had cell phones and those who did not have cell phones, right? Fast forward um, into today, right, in terms of those who have the technology of having computers, those who are able to get online successfully. But one of the key things that has changed, however, is the need to be able to access the digital world around us. And that the pandemic, when it came forth in 2020, right, made that, it's, it's an almost all too familiar story now, right? It put in stark relief uh, the challenges and the gap, the equity gap that we saw in terms of being able to access um, successfully uh, those digital tools and resources. Story we, we are most familiar with uh, is um, K through 12 and students, right? And you would see sometimes hear those stories and, and many, if you're watching online, you might uh, either experience it yourself or perhaps you know of a family or client that you might be working with um, as well, right? That the, the child or the family did not have broadband at home. Maybe they had to go to, uh, you know, McDonald's parking lot or to the library to be able to access and do their homework. We've heard that you know, that story is most prominent but and, and impactful. But there are also equally as impactful stories um, that occurred in this in this theme during the pandemic, right? Seniors and seniors being isolated at home, uh, not having this technology and, and the skills to be able to access, for instance, important services like telehealth, right? As the medical community quickly switched and pivoted. Uh, the ability to do workforce training, which if you're watching online right now and, and part of this conference, you're probably intimately familiar with, right? Suddenly going from in-person workforce training to now, how do you do that from remote, right? And does that, does the person you're trying to help, do they have a computer? Do they have a computer that actually is working? Do they know how to use that computer from home? Are they able to access online? Is their online speed capable of supporting the Zoom? And so on and so on, right? And then just even basic family um, connections. And so coming that back in terms of what my journey was, um, I realized that I was ready to make a change and ready to, you know, we'll call it, some people will call it a professional pivot. Uh, my wife and I actually probably call it, we're going to go ahead and leap into the deep end of the pool without a lifeguard or a life vest and say, this is where I want to go. This is the passion that I want to pursue, which is how do we, how do we help a, the, our entire population 
of, of residents being able to connect to the digital world around them. And when I said that we're in a pivotal moment of time earlier, what I meant by that is that it, at, at for the first time probably um, really ever, we have the resources that are now becoming available both at the federal level and the state level to be able to help close that gap. But one of the challenges, and we're going to talk about that here today, one of the challenges is, is that how do we connect those resources to the people that need them? So what do we hope to accomplish here in our short time together? We're going to review, well, what is the problem of the digital divide? What is the digital divide? We all kind of know it. We all know see it. We've kind of talked about it just now. But what, what is involved with that? Right? We want to learn about the resources that are available uh, and becoming available. And then one of the, the exciting parts about this is understanding that we can all be digital navigators. We all have the ability and the tools to be able to help others do this work. And then finally, why is your advocacy important? Uh, and, and how do we keep this, this momentum that is beginning and really begin to ramp it up, sustain it? When I created um, and left to do create the our nonprofit Connect for Broadband, the goal was to be able to not reinvent the wheel, but to be able to connect the resources that are available and working with, with the client service provider networks that are already out there that have the relationships with the residents who are most likely in need, who have the trust and be able to do, um, be able to empower them to be able to help their clients connect to the resources and the subsidies that exist. And we're going to talk about that and actually have a, a great example that is happening right here in Montgomery County to do that. I have the quote up here. If you see the slide, you have the quote of um, the Literacy Council, the mission statement, right? To advance the social and economic equity for underserved adults through academic instruction and workforce development. And I put that up there because I just thought it's just fantastic, right, as a mission statement. Because what part of what underlies that, though, right, is being able to have the digital tools and network to be able to do that, right? The, the tool set, be able to connect. And so briefly, right, defining the digital divide, I, I kind of thought that that was sort of... Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't, you know, start with, since it's the Literacy Council, of going to the actual um, dictionary definition of what do they have as digital divide, right? And they do a pretty decent job about, about that, right? It defines the digital divide um, as the economic, educational, and social inequalities between those who have computers and online access and those who don't. Um, I added in the parentheses, and the gap between those who have digital skills training to use these technologies and those who do not, right? Because if, as we all know, if, you do, or if you're not familiar, if you're not comfortable, if you're not able to master these technologies, um, then that computer sits on a shelf, the broadband access is underutilized or not utilized at all. But beyond that formal definition, right? I said there's, there's a complexity involved about what the digital divide is, right? There's unserved versus underserved. And I won't go into that too much, except just take the example of, well, what does it mean to be unserved from, from broadband access, right? Rural, if you live in a rural area, being unserved literally means that the last mile plant doesn't get to your home. You don't have the physical infrastructure. That is a, 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 a complex um, challenge in and of itself. We won't talk too much. In fact, we really won't talk about that piece at all here because we could talk about an hour about the rural broadband divide in and of itself. But you can also be unserved, as we know, by having the cable line, the fiber line, the broadband connection coming right by your home or where you live. And the reason, and there are reasons for that, right? There, and we'll get into that as well. And then there's this larger issue about the technology divide. I mentioned earlier, right? The, the from a text divide, you know, 20 years ago was, you know, who had cell phones, who didn't have cell phones. You know, interestingly enough, that, you know, in terms of, you know, smartphone use, it's almost ubiquitous in our society, regardless of income and demographic. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's most folks have a smartphone. But if when you break that down in terms of who has a home computer, that's where you begin to really see the digital um, divide um, take place. And that impact, of course, is why we can do, you know, we can do a lot on our phones. We can't do everything, right? We can go through and, and do, you know, social media apps. Uh, we can even do perhaps even, you know, online banking. But when it comes to perhaps you might need to be able to do more than that, right? Google office suites and, and, and understanding how to, you know, to, to move files in the cloud and all these basic, you know, digital skills that really require more than a smartphone. That lack of access to a computer at home, that's where you begin to see that gap widen. 
I won't go through this whole definition. There's an organization, a great organization nationally called the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Um, and they have a, they've defined uh, what the digital divide is. I, I'll read just a portion of it, right? And it's as technology constantly evolves, right? So we talked about this technology moves forward, right? The digital divide prevents equal participation and opportunity in all parts of life. So while before, right, I like to use that example of the smartphone was the, with the technology divide. Today, the divide is, do you have broadband access at home or do you have a computer at home? We may not know what that technology evolves into tomorrow, but it is incumbent upon us to help ensure that we bring our entire society along with that uh, and being able to participate into that. And then this next part of this, which is right, where it disproportionately affects people of color, indigenous peoples, households with low incomes, people with disabilities, people in rural areas and older adults. And I like that piece because it really points us to where we need to be focusing. And the research and the data back that up as well. You can also look at it as the digital divide, right? Again, sort of the three-legged stool. If you're gonna successfully leap it, computer access, broadband, digital literacy training. Now it's a Saturday morning, uh, uh, here, if you're watching this live and, 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 and in person, so I won't go, um, into too many, um, stats. Um, maybe not everyone's had their full cup of coffee yet. Uh, but, um, just as an example, right? So if you look at from the FCC report back from 2020, this was, was, what, you know, roughly about a year into the pandemic, right? They would show, right, that 98% of all U.S. residents had access to a broadband provider, right? And 91% of rural residents also had access. Uh, and in some places, right, 50% of the country of residents uh, had access to three providers. That's actually the case um, here in Montgomery County. There are, are um, uh, a significant portion of the population in Montgomery County has access to at least three providers. So you would look at that on its face and say, well, what is, again, what is the, the challenge? And part of the challenge when that study was done was how it defined high-speed broadband. It was at, at 25 over three uh, megabits. We, we say today, Quite frankly, that would not be sufficient uh, in terms of, of if you've got a family with multiple people and they're doing multiple Zooms, that's, it's, it's not sufficient bandwidth. Um, and then it really comes by that, yes, you may have broadband available, but are you able to adopt the technology and take advantage of it? And we see, of course, that that's not necessarily the case, right? 77% of all U.S. residents have broadband, right? But that means at least a quarter do not. And when we start to look at that impact, again, this equity impact of especially of people of color and, and lower income families um, across the board, that's where we start to see the numbers dropping, right? 70%, 65%, 57% overall, right, for low income residents have broadband. That means, right, it's a, almost 40% um, do not. If we brought that in a little bit more locally, this is from the Di National Digital Inclusion Alliance again. Um, Households without broadband subscriptions. This data actually comes from census data. So this measures not just who has the available, right, in terms of who has broadband running past their home, but who's actually taking it. If you look at Baltimore, right, 41% of households are not taking uh, broadband subscriptions. That, that is, uh, that's an incredible number, right? And, and actually that number, as, as perhaps maybe as shocking as that is, is actually, um, when you look at some other communities in the country, uh, you know, those numbers go up into the low 60s uh, in terms of not taking broadband subscriptions. That means they may have broadband going by, that they're not taking it. If you look down a little bit closer here, right, into Montgomery County, right, there's so up in Frederick, right, 21%, Gaithersburg, 21%, uh, down Silver Spring, Rockville, right, you see 19, 16%, again, not taking broadband subscriptions. And even though, so right, so almost 20%, almost a quarter of the population households may not be taking broadband, even though right in Montgomery County, you have available three broadband providers. And that's where you begin to really, again, you see that inequity. Um, in Montgomery County, in terms of right, th these numbers are not surprising about location, because as we see from a general divide standpoint, right, we know that on east, you know, east in Montgomery County, kind of center up to north, um, we know that there are income and educational challenges that need to be surmounted, that people are trying to surmount successfully. Um, so it's not surprising to see these numbers follow from a digital standpoint as well. And again, not surprising. What are what are the factors about why then folks are not adopting? Cost has traditionally has been the number one factor. Um, and this is a bit of an older statistic, uh, right? But 26% of U.S. residents were worried about paying their internet bill over the next six months. 
there's the static overall before this definition where we said unserved versus underserved. Underserved is, is not an officially defined term, but you can say perhaps you were underserved if I can only afford to take a certain level of service and I can't take a service that I might need from a speed standpoint, right? So maybe I need that 100 gigabits of speed. Maybe I need that 500 gigabits of speed, but maybe I can't afford that. I would classify that, right, as being you're underserved. You're not being able to, to, to take the technology that you need that perhaps two homes over, three homes over, or a neighborhood over is able to, to do as well. Um, and again, this, the, the other one there, right, again, not surprising. If you're a low-income household, um, you may not be taking broadband at all because of cost. And as uh, several number of speakers um, have said this morning, I, I, I was here present for um, Timothy, Timothy Summers um, a little bit earlier today, uh, right? Our job, our, our workforce is has to be transitioning to at least having a basic digital skills um, set, regardless of industry. Uh, World Economic Forum says, right, by 2030, nine out of 10 jobs will have some type of level of digital skills required, right? That might not be, you know, I've got to, you know, figure out how to do spreadsheet mastery. Um, I, I don't know a lot of us could do spreadsheet mastery. I can't. So, but, but, but we know that it's going to require, um, I know how to access cloud computing. I know how to go uh, to do Zoom. I know how to maybe do some type of office suite, right? That, that again, we know that those type of components are coming um, and rapidly. Uh, pandemic, all the pandemic did was just accelerate everything from a trend line standpoint that was already happening. But the concerning part, right, that next part is from the, as the National Skills Coalition says, right, 31% of US residents don't even have those skills today. And we have to be really concerned about that. If you're watching here from online and those who are in here, you know that already. You, you see it, you're, 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 you're living it in terms of, of, of um, the clients and residents you may be working with. However, I am an optimist at heart. And so uh, I like to, I like the title, I titled this, right? Challenges abound, but so do opportunity. So as I said earlier, we are now at a time where because of the pandemic, incredible amounts of resources have been made available. Uh, over two sets, it, through two sets of fun, federal funding initiatives, the most recent under the Biden infrastructure bill in the fall of 2021, um, there is billions of dollars that has now been earmarked uh, and dedicated for broadband funding, both to extend the physical plant, but then also for this equity piece, right? About actually addressing the cost issue, about how do we reach people um, who need these resources um, and reaching them successfully. Um, and that, that funding, some of that funding has already started to flow. A lot of that funding is only going to be, is getting started to come over the next three to five years. State of Maryland has um, has stepped up. I consider State of Maryland to be a leader in positioning us to be able to take advantage of this funding um, and not waiting as well. Um, transforming at the, the at the state level, uh, creating a Maryland um, statewide um, office of broadband. Uh, originally, there was an office that focused on rural broadband, but acknowledging that broadband challenges right are all encompassing, right? Uh, and beginning to fund uh, grants, digital equity grants uh, that are now coming through um, uh, down to uh, both organizations and local governments. But again, one of the, again, the challenges, I, and, and I'm a very strong believer um, in that uh, you have to meet families uh, and residents where they are with the resources that they need. Um, we, we cannot have this assumption uh, that if we make the resources available, uh, people will come to the resources. Um, that, that, that's where we will know we won't successfully move the needle. Um, and again, we know that there's been data that's, that has been done. Boston Consulting Group did a, did a survey back in 2021. Uh, they said, well, you know, for the programs that exist to help address broadband and why is that, you know, sometimes you would call it a take rate. Sometimes you would call it right in terms of, you know, success and enrollment. What's holding that back? Again, low awareness about the programs, lack of clarity, offerings, lack of trust. Lack of trust is a big one. We'll talk about that in a moment in terms of what's happening in Montgomery County and the program that's trying to address that here. Um, if I, it, I, it's very critical, and this is where I said earlier, in working with existing client provider networks, right, that have the trust of the communities that they are working with. Um, 
And that follows with trying to bring about, their, in terms of the subsidies that exist, the programs that exist that can help subsidize broadband, um, that you have to be able to work, you need to work with, with, with um, uh, folks who have that trust in the communities and then be able to help educate and successfully do outreach. And so let's talk a little bit about what's happening in Montgomery County. Um, I um, uh, do um, a consultant with Montgomery County on this program called Montgomery Connects. Um, Mitzi Herrera is the dir uh, director for the Montgomery Connects program and the Office of Broadband Programming. Um, that actually is part of the Montgomery County's um, technology um, department. Uh, they conceived of this program. Uh, they has program has been um, in existence uh, for uh, several years now, uh, and now they have been adding to it. Um, and it's um, it's very exciting. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and try the link. I said for those who are online, I said before we started the presentation, I said one of my uh, biggest challenges uh, in the last uh, two years was still being able to successfully share my screen for Zoom. Um, because you can see the slides here today, that happened thanks to staff team support here. But my other uh, fear has been when I click on the online link, is it actually going to work? So um, that I embed it. We're going to find out. It does. It's great. It's been a great presentation already if you're watching from online. So it's fantastic. Exactly. That's right. So Montgomery Connects. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll dive right on into what is Montgomery Connects. Montgomery Connects is the county's digital equity and inclusion program. The goal is to provide for every resident and business to be part of our shared digital world, work to achieve this by helping people to get access to computers, the needed technology training, and affordable home broadband services uh, and subsidies. And they do this through public Wi-Fi access uh, and through a series of different um, programs we're going to talk about here. So actually six programs, we're going to talk about two of them specifically. Uh, so, right, it's not by coincidence. The Montgomery Connects program is designed to address the three areas that are the holdbacks, right? Computer access. Uh, broadband access and the training, trying to be comprehensive about it all the way through. And so let's, we'll start with actually the Computer for You program. Montgomery County uh, applied for a federal grant um, through the Emergency Connectivity Fund from um, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. Uh, if you're not familiar with what the FCC is, that's the federal government sort of community. They, they have purview over all communications, including broadband. Um, they have been making grants available as this funding, as I mentioned earlier, has now started to flow. Um, the county applied for a grant for 50,000 new uh, Chromebook laptop computers to be made available um, for lower income residents here in Montgomery County. So now this is the part where I said earlier, right, we said everyone can be a digital navigator and everyone can help. So I'm going to get into the weeds of this a little bit uh, to show how uh, this program is available and how um, you can help guide uh, people that you may work with to be able to take advantage of this. So the Montgomery Connects com uh, uh, the C Computer for You program. The program was designed, tremendous credit to Montgomery County on this. Um, program, um, the Computer for You program was designed to try to remove as many barriers as possible while still staying within the requirements of the grant to be able to get a computer to those who are needed. So the first step that was taken before the grant was even awarded was to right, analyze where's the greatest need. And we said earlier, need is on the East County Center and up to the North. And so the county created these um, distribution events that you pre-register for. And they're located primarily East County, Mid County, and North County, trying to locate these events in the most transit accessible locations possible, right? So rec centers, county services centers, um, uh, areas that that again, right, that are you know, physically uh, are accessible. And all anyone what needs to do is that they go onto the website here, and we can make this information available afterwards through uh, the Literary Council, uh, the Literary Council's network. I'm getting a nod from Christopher, so that's good. Uh, and it lists the upcoming distribution events that are occurring. And then it lists the the available appointments. And you can simply then point to someone that says, oh, okay, at the Grill, Grill Cross Center on October 15th on, in Wheaton, uh, they'll be doing a computer distribution. Click on that link. And there, 
you can go ahead and you can you click on through and you can register through. I will um, I will say that the um, the demand right as could be expected has been tremendous for the program. Uh, new time slots and new appointments open up every Sunday at two o'clock, uh, and they do fill very quickly. If you are happening to be um, have an organization, and for those who are online, if you happen to be working with an organization that is working with uh, clients directly, you can contact us at Montgomery Connects. Um, there, if you go to the Montgomery Connects page, there's an actual email from Montgomery Connects and say, I'm working with an organization that is working with residents in need. Um, how can I help set up um, uh, a distribution event or, um, you know, help, uh, you know, clients that we're working with? Um, please reach out. We will be glad to work uh, with you to um, help arrange that and help do those logistics um, as well. The other part with Montgomery Connects is the helping families enroll in ACP. And ACP stands for the Affordable Connectivity Program. It's been in existence since the beginning of this year. It actually replaces a temporary program whose acronym I'm not even going to worry about. Uh, but ACP is a, is, provides a federal subsidy to provide that allows you to be able to provide free or discounted internet. Uh, the federal government makes available up to $30 per month, uh, for, uh, families who qualify, residents who qualify. Uh, and, um, the state of Maryland, uh, layers on an additional $15 automatically so that when you register for ACP and you qualify, you then are able, uh, and you go to a provider. Uh, the state of Maryland's program uh, kicks in as well, so up to a forty-five dollar per month subsidy. Um, this, this is, this is when we talk about broadband. When we talk about cost, this is the game changer um, because prior to really almost a year ago, uh, this type of scale never existed uh, before. Uh, now, in terms of how um, how to go ahead and how to enroll, so what Montgomery Connects does is provide enrollment assistance into the ACP program. Uh, if you have an appointment you make and you register uh, an appointment to come in to uh, pick up a computer at one of the distribution centers, at every computer distribution, there is a team that is dedicated to help enroll uh, that same resident into the ACP program. So you walk in, go into your appointment time, you pick up your laptop computer, you can then go to the next table, the ACP table, and the team will then uh, walk you through the application and actually, um, uh, we, they, we use iPads, um, to go ahead and put the application up and try to enroll the person in the application right on site. Um, and then, um, at the same distribution events, we, uh, invite internet service providers to attend as well. So Comcast, Verizon, T-Mobile. Uh, and so ideally, right, the ideal scenario, this is that a person comes in, they pick up their laptop computer, they get help to enroll and enroll in ACP application. They get approved from that application. They take that application ID and they go then to the third table and be able to apply that either to their existing internet account and get that discount or it becomes free. Or if they don't have internet today, they go ahead and they can open up internet account um, right on site. Right. That goes into this entire part, this entire objective, which is try, try to do this comprehensively. Uh, because I, I think we know, uh, that the, if someone does not, um, someone does not able to enroll into the ACP application that day, the odds that they will enroll into that application later on decrease significantly. And that's frankly perfectly understandable, right? If, if, if I have, you know, my life might be, you know, stressed as it is. Um, and if I've got, you know, two kids and they're running around and I don't get to the application now, I've got other, other needs that I've got to be able to meet and successfully, um, overcome. So that's why we're trying to at these distribution events. Let's try to get it all done at the same time. Um, and the other part of this is that, uh, what Montgomery Connects is doing is, is that we will also, uh, reach out, uh, and we also invite partners that if you want to hold, um, an ACP enrollment session, um, we will do that uh, even uh, without um, the computer distribution um, to be able to help um, uh, clients, residents you might be working with um, to successfully um, enroll in the program. The other thing that we 
uh, Montgomery Connects attempts to try to do and does is, is train the trainer. Um, and we're very interested in this piece as well. Working with organizations, right? Again, with the client provider networks to understand how you can help enroll the, um, the folks that you are working with into the ACP program. Because if we're going to, to, to reach the numbers that we need to reach that are eligible for ACP, the only way to do that is to create a sustainable um, network that, in which that happens. Um, and so we're really trying to lean into that train-the-trainer model um, for it. All right. The other part of what Montgomery Connects um, also offers is what's called Senior Planet Montgomery that um, they work with that as a program um, out of AARP. Uh, and Senior Planet Montgomery is basically digital literacy um, training uh, for adults 60 and older. Uh, tremendously successful programs, uh, you know, learning how to use Zoom, um, online classes. Um, and that information is also made all is made available at these um, at the computer distribution events as well. So right, that's the last piece of it, right? Computer, broadband, and then um, information about how to access the training. Real quick, let's go ahead and just take you to the ACP program. So this is the federal website, FCC's website for uh, the Affordable Connectivity Program. I, I wanted to, um, I inserted this in here um, because one of the reasons um, one of the reasons that we that that we're we're, um, we're very dedicated to having a team um, on site to help people enroll in the application is um, because the application is is not is is not particularly easy necessarily to navigate, <laughs> um, and um, and I that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up here because so you, know, you can do the application online you, you can do it by paper but online is where you are able to get the instant but just to kind of show right so you. If you went to the portableconnectivity.gov, you hit you hit a you know apply, um, you know great graphics. Um, but again, right? If if you're sort of in a hurry, uh, or perhaps you have a, a you know a language barrier, uh, or perhaps you might just be technology hesitant, uh, right? Again, now I'm you know I'm going down, so I just hit apply now. Then right, you've got to go. You got to hit apply now. That's two apply nows just to to sort of before keeping track. All right, and then you start with the application. And the application for the ACP application uh, is actually a two-step process in and of itself. That you, what you're doing first is that you have to first register uh, in terms of um, um, into the, the sort of the benefit database. And then the next step on that application is actually qualifying. And part of that is then uploading uh, benefit documents uh, to show uh, whether you qualify or not, right? So, um, and let me go back, I'll go back to the slides here. So this is the, the criteria in terms of households, how are households eligible for ACP, right? If you, and it's it's taking any of these. So Medicaid, um, this, um, SNAP, school lunch program, you can qualify um, through your child. Pell Grants, significant. Uh, uh, and also, um, just, um, simply by income, uh, as well. And if you were to go back to the Montgomery Connect site, it actually lists what those income numbers are, uh, for 200%, up to 200% of the poverty level. Um, but again, it's, it's one of these things where it's just enough steps that you might be dissuaded to completing that application. And that's why this entire notion of, of how do we help build a navigator network? And the fact that everybody can become navigators um, as part of what you may be already doing um, is so essential and is so um, and is so uh, critical uh, to be able to scale uh, the 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 benefit program up. We we'll talk a little bit about um, Senior Planet Montgomery. Uh, the last piece I just want to um, jump back to here, back to the Montgomery Connects in the in the Computer for You program, because uh, I would be um, remiss if I did not. Um, point out specifically is so the, the the criteria for the computer for you program is different from the ACP program, right? So the ACP program is a, is a direct federal benefit with its own criteria, a specific set of criteria. The computer for you program 
is eligible for any Montgomery County resident uh, who is seven years old and older. They uh, it is one computer per person, uh, and each person in order to register um, needs to register using um, must have a library card number. Uh, that is done because the grant um, is in part is um, actually through the library system administered by the Office of Broadband Programs. Um, however, there is no um, income document um, proof required. Um, you 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 enter into you just enter that information. Uh, your contact information, uh, and then it'll give you a registration for your appointment. And then when you come to your appointment, you do have to come in person. Uh, you cannot pick up computers for other people. Uh, and then uh, when you come, uh, you bring your uh, registration uh, um, confirmation, and then uh, go, and then you'll, they'll take you for your appointment. But I did want to make sure to point that out uh, because that that again that the program was designed to try to remove as many barriers as possible. Um, to be able to get computers in the, in, um, to families who need them. And then the, the last slide, we'll go right here, is just this last piece of your advocacy matters on this issue. And I know I just got done saying there's a tremendous amount of federal funding, state funding that is coming. But there is still tremendous need, right? There is need for um, devices for families and residents that are in need. Uh, there is tremendous need for support for navigator programs, right? Benefit programs are only, uh, I believe, really successful as far as that they actually get to the families that need them and the families are able to successfully enroll in them and take advantage of them. And we need to be able to scale that up when it comes to the digital divide and these digital tools and resources that are out there, being getting them to the to the people um, who truly need them. Uh, and with that, um, that uh, concludes my presentation. Um, thank you uh, very much. <laughs>